The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, music, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Gregory Hopkins, the artistic director of the Harlem Opera Company. Welcome to African American Legends. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Hello to you and to your viewing audience. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. It's a pleasure to talk about opera in the Harlem community. Uh, tell us just how did the Harlem Opera Company get started? In actuality, more than 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I was reading an article in a periodical uh, about an opera company being started in the community. Well, with my background in opera, as I saw this ad in the paper, I said, well, if there's an opera company being started right here in Harlem, mm -hmm. I ought to know about mm -hmm. it. I called, made arrangements to meet with the person that was starting it. We hit it off. That person is no longer with us. And a few years after that, we decided to reorganize after having first organized under the name of Harlem Opera Company. We reorganized and the board thought that I needed to be the artistic uh, director, changed the name to Harlem Opera Theater, so now we have the acronym HOT. Very interesting. Very. Now, this is related to Convent Avenue Baptist Church, or is that just your headquarters? It's related to Convent Avenue Baptist Church in that I serve as the Minister of Music mm -hmm. at Convent Avenue Baptist Church. And Convent Avenue has been very gracious to us in terms of providing us rehearsal space, performing opportunities, but the relationship does not go any further than that. Now, what is your opera background? Well, I graduated from the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia, which is mm -hmm. a very exclusive conservatory. Having done my master's degree in opera there and a bachelor's degree in voice, so when I first moved to New York to take the position at Convent Avenue Church, my real impetus for making the move from Philadelphia was to put me in New York so that I would be in better proximity for the auditions, for the coachings, for the conductors that came through this great town because I thought I was on my way mm -hmm. to an international career. I had uh, years of contracts with the New York City Opera, who I sang with for uh, about four seasons did some coverages at the Metropolitan Opera, did a great deal of performing with the Opera Orchestra of New York here at uh, Carnegie Hall, and uh, many symphony orchestras around the country as well as abroad had done several international vocal competitions. So I didn't want to come to New York and be the typical starving artist waiting for the doors to open and just sort of twiddling my thumbs mm -hmm and taking voice lessons and coachings before gigs. I had done church work all of my life. What and, church? Well, I was in Vine Memorial Baptist Church in Philadelphia for 15 years before mm -hmm. relocating to um, New York, and now I've been at Convent Avenue Baptist Church for 21 years. Wow, that's quite a background. That's quite well, a... I'm very grateful for being able to find my way in this world by doing something that I enjoy so very much. As you know, on African American Legends, we talk with writers and artists and movie producers and sports figures. This is the first time we had someone from the world of opera. Now, tell us what attracted you to opera? Uh, what does the opera community have to offer the African-American community, and what does the African-American community have to offer the opera community? Well, the thing that first attracted me to opera, like so many, I grew up in the church, mm -hmm. and the church provided for me my very first platform for performing, for learning music, for interacting with audiences, even from a, long, from a young age when I started singing with uh, the children's choir in my church. Unlike many of the churches today, the church that I grew up in had a very, very diverse 
music program. What was the church you grew up in? Again, Vine Memorial Baptist Church. Oh, yeah, that's in a very well known African American church. Really. And um, they not only sang gospel music, which uh, is so wonderful and so energetic, they did the great Negro spirituals of our mm -hmm. culture. And uh, many times for special concerts, we would bring in uh, singers like William Warfield. Mm -hmm to be our guest performers, Florence Quivar, who is also a native of Philadelphia. And often I was teamed up even as a teenager, as a tenor soloist singing the Verdi Requiem with William Warfield as my bass solo, mm -hmm. soloist and Florence Quivar as my mezzo-soprano soloist. And so I got a wonderful taste of singing classical music and was able to develop my skills and my abilities as well as my love mm -hmm. for this genre. Uh, my choir director at that time, Charles Robert Jones, who is still living, having served in that great church for more than 50 years as director of music, encouraged me to go further with my music. My mother and father had sung for years in church choir my father was finally encouraged to give it up when um, my younger brother was born and the choir director encouraged my dad to please stay home from choir rehearsal and take care of his children so that his wife, my mother, could come to choir rehearsal. He was not quite as musical as my mom and not quite as uh, necessary to the process. And so we got a great deal of encouragement through that situation, going to a high school in Philadelphia that was part of what we called at that time the Magnet Program. Mm -hmm. The Magnet Program in high school has the capability of drawing people from all over the city and the inner city who want to focus on certain areas. So they allocate certain schools to concentrate on certain majors, if you will. So I went to a high school that would be the equivalent of the music and art hmm. um, school here, LaGuardia, Overbrook High School, famous for Wilt Chamberlain and many, many others, Bill Cosby. I uh, graduated from that program and then went on to Temple University. But my very, very first exposure to opera was in my elementary school. I went. Uh, to an integrated elementary school. It was integrated um, not in the natural sense, but we were integrated through busing. So I was bused to a predominantly Jewish elementary school. And on an outing one day, we went to see a film of Madame Butterfly. This film starred Anna Maffo, mm -hmm. who happens to also have been a graduate of Curtis Institute. Mm -hmm. And it was when I saw the real magic of how you could tell a story, singing songs, that I was drawn to want to learn more about opera. In a sense, that's what gospel does too. Gospel tells, tells a story, story in song. about the struggle for freedom. Absolutely. And it was interesting as you were talking, the juxtaposition between opera and gospel, but you still have the vocal dynamics, you still have the projection, and you still have a story. Absolutely. Now, opera is a style of music, but there could very legitimately and very realistically be an opera written in the gospel style. That's your next challenge. That that certainly is. That's your next challenge. And I think that there are some people who may have uh, explored that possibility. Now, one question that some people would ask is, opera is a, basically a European-oriented musical form, although it does have opera all over the world. Uh, what would attract African Americans, other than their interest in music generally, to become involved in opera? Well, I'm very, very blessed to be surrounded with pictures of great legends mm -hmm. all around me mm -hmm. who broke color barriers in their individual fields. Coming up in a city like Philadelphia, it was not unusual for us to put people like Marian Anderson, who mm -hmm. had a similar background, mm -hmm grew up in the church, mm -hmm. and then had this wonderful career that led to her breaking the color barrier here in New York City at the Metropolitan Opera as the first African-American 
leading singer. Just like these legends, African Americans have proven that they can excel in anything, given the talent, given the skills, mm. and given the opportunity. So you ask the question, why opera? Why not opera? Mm -hmm. If God has given you the talent, the ability, and if you've had the opportunity to have the educational exposure, which means in addition to the music education, uh, language, explain, uh, language education, because as you have stated, many operas are not written in English. Some are, but um, Italian is probably the most common language. Then there's French, there's German, there's a special kind of Spanish opera called Sarsuela. There are many, many operas written in Russian and Czech. So you can see language is a large part of the uh, educational processes for opera singers. So why not opera? But what about the content of opera? Um, opera has, you know, love, they have tr tragedy, they have competition, but the content sometimes seems subservient to the beautiful music. How, how do you relate that? Well, I don't know. It's like the old story, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Sometimes the content can be a little silly. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there are operas that have uh, remained kind of unknown because the music is either not great or the stories are just not believable. But as one of uh, great conductors that I have worked with, Miss Eve Queller, often said, real life is often much more unbelievable than opera. Mm -hmm. Certainly the stories in opera deal with tragedy, they deal with love, mm -hmm. they deal with war, they deal with death. Um, and these are things that we come into uh, contact with on an everyday basis. And music is something that enlightens our spirits also on an everyday basis. So just like people watch and become addicted to soap opera, <laughs> which is no more than life on television, opera is kind of an extension of that. Mm -hmm. It is life, but set to music. Now, with this uh, Harlem Opera Theater, that's right. how do you recruit the people who participate? Well, we have auditions periodically. Uh, we are doing a competition, which is our next big effort, in which we hope to help to encourage the upcoming generation of opera singers. Our competition is set for the Apollo Theater, the world-famous Apollo Theater, on the sound stage, and it will take place next month, June the 20th, Friday night at 6.30. Now, in that competition, we are sort of trying to catch um, on to a little bit of the uh, reality TV mania that is going on, <laughs> in that we're going to have a distinguished panel of judges mm -hmm. for our preliminaries and for our finals. Those judges will include Eve Queller, who is the artistic director here in New York for the Opera Orchestra of New York, Raoul Abdul, who is music critic for the Amsterdam News, Neil Gorin, who's one of the people who prepares for the Mostly Mozart Festival and is artistic director for his own opera company in the Village, Wayne Sanders, one of the founding uh, directors of Opera Ebony, and people of that caliber. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have asked Martina Arroyo to be our celebrity host. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten a confirmation from her yet, but that's who we're looking for. And she had a very, very distinguished mm -hmm. operatic career here in the Metropolitan and abroad. So one of the real ways in which we are hoping to access tomorrow's great stars is through our competition at the Apollo on June 20th on the soundstage at 6.30 
on that Friday evening. Is the evening. public invited? The public is invited. Mm -hmm. Tickets are $28, mm -hmm. and you can get them through the Apollo uh -huh. box office. Now, when you have these competitions, these folks have had to have had some training and experience. How did they learn, your competitors, the people who come to join your theater company, how do they learn to sing? What is the basis of their getting into opera? Well, the, most of them, many of them, have backgrounds that are similar to mine, mm -hmm. coming up having sung in church. Mm -hmm. But schools are often today being deprived of legitimate mm -hmm. music education as sports programs, arts programs, music programs are being cut. There are schools in New York that don't even have music teachers, schools in New York that don't have chorus programs. So many young people are not having the opportunity to develop their talents or to even find out if there is any talent or skill there. Mm -hmm. So those of us who are uh, working like I am in the church have even a greater responsibility to try and tap in to special talents when we find them, to give them the encouragement, to give them the opportunities, and to give them the exposure that they have. Our black schools are also picking up the gauntlet, recognizing that many inner city school schools, many inner city kids, don't have the opportunity to develop artistic um, excellence. So they're getting to college with great voices, but basically untutored and untapped. So African-American historically black schools are taking raw talent and giving them the opportunity to develop these skills so that they can be the stars, the opera stars of the great legends of tomorrow. Well, many times when people get interested in things, they have seen the performances. Now, opera isn't on television very much, so how many of these people, young people, actually go to opera? How much experience have they seen, have seeing opera so that that would motivate them to get into your company? One of the things that we have initiated as a pilot program for, op for Harlem Opera Theater is our in-school educational program called Opera for Beginners. Mm -hmm. Now, a beginner can be a school child, but it can also be an adult who has never had the opportunity. So through this program, we offer to bring opera to your schools. You don't have to be a kid, as I said earlier, or a young person not to have ever mm -hmm. experienced opera. So through that program, we can bring an operatic production to a school. We can also bring a concert to a church, as we have done in many uh, mm -hmm. instances. We can provide entertainment for your community group, the links, your sorority. So opera, Harlem Opera Theater can provide you with the services that will offer you exposure to this neglected and underserved art form. Well, many operas are very long, so and the attention span of kids sometimes is short. So what do you do? Excerpts from operas? And we give do, them the background of the story and so on? We do excerpts of operas, and we also do age-appropriate things. Mm -hmm. We do things that we feel the kids can, the young people, can relate to. For example? For example, the prayer from Hansel and Gretel, mm -hmm. two children who mm -hmm. are lost in the forest, uh -huh. and they're praying that God would keep them mm -hmm. safe uh, through the night from all of the things that uh, could scare you in, an, uh, in a forest, do in an opera Do you use scenery, or do you just come Generally, we don't. Uh -huh. Generally, we don't, not in this kind of a forum. Mm -hmm. And I must tell you that Harlem Opera Theater we have not graduated to doing full productions mm -hmm. because as we generate the artists mm -hmm. in f from within our community, we are also trying to generate and educate the audience. Mm -hmm. So not everyone that we expose to this wonderful art form mm -hmm. of opera 
is uh, necessarily going to become a great singer. But we hope through our education, through our exposure, through our work in the community that we can also develop the audiences for tomorrow's opera stars. Well, how would the audience be able to get in touch with Harlem Opera Theater to find out about your productions, about your classes, and so on? How do you get in touch? Well, first of all, we do have a website, www.harlemoperatheater.org. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can personally be reached through my offices at the Convent Avenue Baptist Church by telephone, the number being area code 212-234-6767. The name again, Gregory Hopkins. I serve at Convent Avenue Baptist Church. As the Minister of Music, you'll find me there at Extension 32. And I also delight in being the Artistic Director for the Harlem Opera Theater. Now, uh as the music director, on Sunday morning or Saturday or Friday, uh, the, your gospel or your church choir must be performing as well in conjunction with the services. Absolutely. So I have a very, very diverse musical life and a very, very full palette. What's Thank your you. dream for the Harlem Opera Theater? If my you dream, dream. My okay. dream for the Opera Theater is that we would be able to develop a season that would include within the next five years uh -huh. three to four full productions in a calendar year. Our competition, this is our pilot year, uh -huh. so we're hoping that that will take off with a bang and that we'll be able to do that year after year and continue to encourage young singers and let them know that this is not a forbidden fruit that we would have a schedule of schools that was so busy that we couldn't keep up with the demand. We really have more singers in our community mm -hmm. than we can find work and opportunities for. Uh, what are the three operas you'd like to present first? Well, people love to see African Americans doing Porgy and Porgy Bess. And Bess. Mm -hmm. That, however, is not one of my dreams. <laughs> there are a lot of people that are taking advantage of that bandwagon. Mm -hmm. But the audience, I almost said congregation. You see, I've been in church a little too long. Uh -huh. the, audience the audiences love Porgy and Bess, and you can almost assure success yeah. when that is a program uh, favorite. Another thing that African Americans are often identified with is the lovely opera by Verdi, Verdi. Mm -hmm. Aida. Mm -hmm. Now, it requires monumental forces, not only fantastic singers who are A-level, but it is literally an opera that requires camels mm -hmm. and elephants and scenery. And so that would be a dream down the line somewhere, but probably not in the five-year plan. Mm -hmm. I would like to, within the next five years, focus on operas that give Harlem Opera Theater a reason for being. In other words, I don't really feel as though we can make such a great impact upon the opera scape of this city by doing the same thing that the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Opera mm -hmm. is doing, or the same thing that the New York City Opera mm -hmm. is doing, but by carving out a niche for ourselves, promoting the neglected operas of persons like William Grant Still, mm -hmm. who composed um, in the Harlem community, who was the first African American to conduct a major symphony orchestra, who was the first African American to conduct uh, here in the New York City Opera, who was the first African American to write a piece that was performed by a major symphony, putting music like uh, the music that he wrote in the forefront. Operas that need African Americans, like L'Africaine, the African girl, mm -hmm. that uh, would require people singing who are black mm -hmm. of hue and don't have to wear makeup, mm -hmm. as so many have in the past, mm -hmm. in order to um, to be believable as their characters. Othellos and things like that, that would give us 
a real reason for our being. Mm -hmm. The wonderful um, work of people like Hall Johnson, mm -hmm. who did shows on Broadway like Green Pastures and Run Little Children, would be a dream of mine to recreate those mm -hmm. Hall Johnson uh, productions uh, using the talent that is today and the wonderful sensibility of the Negro spiritual that Hall Johnson framed in those pieces. As we come to the close of the program, do you have any funding sources that you are cultivating? We are cultivating anyone who has $10 that they want to give to us, mm -hmm. 10 cents that they want to give to us, or $10,000 oh, that 10 they would million. like to, There you go. <laughs> Carol Brown, who is responsible for making the introduction of me to you, mm -hmm. is our board secretary. She's the hardest working person in this opera company, mm -hmm. and she is constantly beating the bushes for funding sources mm -hmm. that, would, um, that would help us to create these dreams. Well, we Citibank has been a great, great help to us, among others. We certainly want to wish you well. You certainly have educated me and the audience about opera, uh, the Harlem Opera Theater, and uh, we look forward to your success, and we want to thank again Gregory Hopkins, the creative director of the Harlem Opera Theater, for being with us on today's African American Legends.